so <laughs> it's a long chapter. And uh, we're going to get through the whole chapter today because even though it's a long chapter, a summary of the history of the, uh, that Stephen chose to point out to the council of uh, the Jewish people, there was a point to all of it. And the point is Congress. He's, he's building to something that he really wants to get through. And we could parse out all the specific sections with all of the history, but you know what? Y'all got that in your Old Testament. Go back and read it. And it's all there, but we're going to go through Acts chapter 7 today. Let's pray, and then we'll be talking about Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Lord, we thank you. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for what you've done for us, your goodness, your grace, your mercy that you show us every day, paying the price that we could never pay so that we could enter into relationship with the living God. What an amazing thing. Relationship with you. No longer all the things that we have to do to try and have righteousness before you. But just the one thing. Jesus Christ and Him crucified. The sacrifice that He paid that allows us, through Him, to be justified in Your presence, to be redeemed from our sin, and to have relationship restored with You. What an amazing thing that you have done for us. And Lord, I pray as we go through this chapter together and as we look at all that Stephen said, all that you spoke through him and the result and repercussions of that, Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts, that we would be challenged to live like that, and that we would draw closer to you. In Jesus' name, amen. So Stephen, we are told a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. And over the past couple of weeks, we've taken a look at how the multitude of believers that had come together since the day of Pentecost had grown into quite a fellowship. And now in the Acts chapter 6, we started reading about uh, how they encountered its first internal dissension as the Hellenist widows were feeling that the Hebrew widows were being shown favoritism in the daily distribution. So the apostles responded by raising leadership to assist in the oversight of the work of the church, oversight in the ministry. And seven men were selected to serve. And the work was tended to. The apostles stayed on mission in studying the word of God, in prayer, and the result was that the gospel spread. More came to know Jesus as Savior, and the impact was so great that we were told that even some of the priests came to believe that Jesus was Messiah. And through this, God began to change that fellowship, that multitude that became a fellowship. He began to change them into a body, into a body that flowed and functioned inside of their giftings. And Luke then begins to focus on one of the members of the leadership group that had been raised. He begins to focus on Stephen. Like we said, a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit. And we were told in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, 15, through 15, what happened next in the ministry life of Stephen. We're told in Acts chapter 6, verse 7, that then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people. And then there arose some from what is called the synagogue of the freedmen, Cyrenians, Alexandrians, those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. And then they secretly induced men to say, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people, the elders and the scribes. And they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. So that's what we went through last week. Stephen, a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. He was just willing to serve. That's what he was placed in leadership to do. To serve, to be a deacon to deke, <laughs> to serve, just 
serving the widows. And he helped to tend to that. And God worked through his humility and obedience and did wondrous things. And he stood in perfect peace before an angry and hostile council that sought any reason at all to pounce on these followers of Jesus and absolutely destroy that movement. Stephen was at peace without knowing anything that was about to happen next. He was at peace filled throughout the essence of his being is what it meant, filled with the Holy Spirit. Now I'm currently reading a book by Oswald Smith called The Man God Uses. And in the beginning of one of the chapters, he wrote this. I am absolutely convinced that any man who is willing to pay the price may be used of God regardless of talents or gifts, not perhaps to the extent of some, but certainly to the full limit of his capacity, and if not, well, the fault is his. Now, it may cost a good deal. God does not always reveal the whole price at once. But when we reach that place where we are so desperately in earnest about it that we are willing to make any sacrifice, it is then that God can begin to use us. Are you willing to pay the price? Stephen was. Stephen was willing. I don't think the price mattered to him. Stephen was just, if you could say that, just serving tables. He was serving the fellowship by tending to the widows in the daily distribution, but doing it full of faith full of the power of the Holy Spirit. He didn't know what the cost would be to his faithful service, but love compelled him to be faithful. Now some, albeit few, like Paul, for instance, were shown how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. Now there's no indication that Stephen was shown how his life would be brought to an abrupt end, but clearly Stephen had the heart for God described in that passage by Oswald Smith. There was no price that he was unwilling to pay for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. For how else can be one filled with the Holy Spirit to the entirety of his being unless he's completely submitted to God? And over this next chapter of Acts, Acts chapter 7 and on into Acts 8, we see the result of that willingness. And truthfully, we still see the result today. A man willing to stand before the authority of the Sanhedrin before the authority of the council, and give these learned men a history lesson of their own people, of their forefathers. And Stephen gave a sermon that resulted in his being stoned to death. That's true. And the lives that it affected over a couple of thousand years since he stood before these men, oh, it's absolutely innumerable. A man willing to pay any price to be used by God was used mightily. Now, let's stand. We're going to read through this sermon. It's a long passage, chapter 7. And if you need to sit, no worries, do so. But let's see how the flow of what Stephen recounted to the council, how it went. Again, if you need to sit, don't worry about it. If you can stand, stand. And uh, let's begin in Acts 6, 12. We're going to go straight into Acts chapter 7. Acts 6, 12. Again, it says, And they stirred up the people the elders, and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him, and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, This man does not cease to seek blasphemous words against the holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. And all who sat in the council looked steadfastly at him, saw his face as the face of an angel. Then the high priest said, Are these things so? And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans and dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it. Not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And then he gave him the covenant of circumcision. 
And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt and all his house. Now famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan. And our fathers found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers. And Joseph's family became known to the Pharaoh. And then Joseph sent and called for his father Jacob and all his relatives to him. Seventy-five people. So Jacob went down to Egypt. And he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. And when the time of the promise drew near, which God had sworn to Abraham, the people grew and multiplied in Egypt, till another king arose who did not know Joseph. This man dealt treacherously with our people and oppressed our fathers, making them expose their babies so that they might not live. At this time Moses was born and was well-pleasing to God. And he was brought up in his father's house for three months. But when he was set out, Pharaoh's daughter took him away and brought him up as her own son. And Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. Now when he was 40 years old, it came into his heart to visit his brother and the children of Israel. And seeing one of them suffer wrong, he defended and avenged him who was oppressed and struck down the Egyptian. For he supposed that his brethren would have understood that God would deliver them by his hand. But they did not understand. And the next day he appeared to two of them as they were fighting. And tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brethren. Why do you wrong one another? But he who did his neighbor wrong pushed him away, saying, Who made you ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you did the Egyptian yesterday? And then at this saying, Moses fled and became a dweller in the land of Midian, where he had two sons. And when forty years had passed, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire in a bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. When Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight, and as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. And then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their groaning and have, not, and have come down to deliver them. And now come. I will send you to Egypt. And this Moses, whom they rejected, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out. And after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years, this is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, who spoke to him on Mount Sinai, and with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt, saying to Aaron, Make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses, who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven. As it is written in the book of the prophets, Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during forty years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech, and the star of your god, Rephan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Our fathers had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness, as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God, and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob, as Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? You stiff-necked 
and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. And they stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with this sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Lord, thank you. Thank you for the faithfulness that you show us every day. And Lord, thank you for the witness of Stephen that it's recorded so that we can recount it, so we could be encouraged by his life, and so that we could see you glorified and magnified. Work in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. You can be seated. It's a long chapter. What a recounting of the history of their people. Now, it's selective. It's not a complete recounting. But look at all he covered. He covered the call of Abraham, the patriarchs, how they ended up in Egypt, how God delivered them from slavery through Moses, the rebellion in the hearts of the people, and how it related to the true dwelling place of God. Now, we're not going to look at every single section of this in detail as we go through, but we will review the main points Stephen is trying to make with each section because all of it is building to the point he wants to make to this council. So let's begin with the open-ended question that the high priest asked Stephen. In chapter 7, verse 1, Then the high priest said, Are these things so? Now, the high priest mentioned here was probably still Caiaphas. It still hasn't been that long since the crucifixion of Christ. The same man who sat in judgment of our Savior is now sitting in judgment of Stephen. And the high priest listens to the accusations against Stephen, and he invites Stephen to answer them. Now, Stephen's accused of speaking blasphemous words against Moses, blasphemous words against the holy place, the temple, blasphemous words against the law, and blasphemous words against God. And they additionally accuse Stephen of saying that Jesus would destroy both the temple and the customs delivered through Moses. Now, as we read in his response, Stephen gave a large, sweeping panorama of Old Testament history. And he, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> and he's not telling them anything new here. He's not trying to instruct them like they don't know history. But he is emphasizing a few things in Jewish history that they may not have wanted to consider in the way that Stephen's bringing it to them. Things like God never confined himself to one place, like the temple. And that the people had a habit of rejecting those that God had sent to them. Now Stephen had been accused. The council listened to the accusations. And the high priest asked Stephen if the accusations were true. But Stephen's not giving a defense of himself. He's not answering the baseless accusations. He wasn't interested in defending himself. He simply wanted to proclaim the truth about Jesus in a way that people could understand. Stephen knew that the truth that is that God is not in the temple made by human hands, but in the temples made by His hand. That things had changed. The veil was torn. We had access to the living God because of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. No longer was the glory of God behind the veil in the temple. The veil was torn. It's not there. Now he's dwelling inside of the temple made without hands, made by his hands. Through Jesus Christ, the way had been made for God himself to reside in his people, made by his hands, paid for by his blood. All was different now in the new covenant given by Jesus, and he presented these truths by pointing to the history of the people. 
And he began with the call of Abraham in verses 2 through 5, where it says, And he said, Brethren and fathers, listen. The glory of God appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia, before he dwelt in Haran. And he said to him, Get out of your country and from your relatives and come to a land that I will show you. And then he came out of the land of the Chaldeans, dwelt in Haran. And from there, when his father was dead, he moved him to this land in which you now dwell. And God gave him no inheritance in it, not even enough to set his foot on. But even when Abraham had no child, he promised to give it to him for a possession and to his descendants after him. Here's the point Stephen was getting at. God appeared to Abraham before he came to the promised land. The physical temple was unnecessary for this visit from God to Abraham. It, he was trying to get across that it wasn't like God was sitting on Mount Zion, you know, the temple mount. It's not like God was sitting there where they think God was and yelling to Moses or to Abraham in Mesopotamia, going, Hey, come over here to me. No, it's not like that. God visited Abraham while he was still in the land of the Chaldeans. God appeared to Abraham where Abraham was. He is not restricted to a tabernacle, nor a temple. God is much bigger than that. And Stephen will drive this point home throughout and later in his sermon. The other thing Stephen points out is that even though God told Abraham to go, Abraham only went part way at first. He went to Haran, and he waited there until his father died. But Abraham's partial obedience did not take away God's promise. But the fulfillment of the promise did not happen until Abraham went to the place God wanted him to go. And God then gave Abraham foresight into what would happen to his descendants and also gave him the covenant in verses 6 through 8. And it says this, But God spoke in this way, that his descendants would dwell in a foreign land and that they would bring them into bondage and oppress them for 400 years. And the nation to whom they will be in bondage, I will judge, said God. And after that, they shall come out and serve me in this place. And then he gave them the covenant of circumcision. And so Abraham begot Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day. And Isaac begot Jacob, and Jacob begot the twelve patriarchs. He gave him the covenant of circumcision, beginning the process of God coming to his people with promises in the form of covenant. Covenants that God made really only with himself. Promises that were irrefutable. Because he didn't make them as a co-party with us or with Abraham. God himself made the promise by the only thing he could, himself. And then Stephen points out how God showed his faithfulness through Joseph in verses 9 through 16. And it says, And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. But God was with him and delivered him out of all of his troubles and gave him favor and wisdom in the presence of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And he made him governor over Egypt. And all his house. Now famine and great trouble came over all the land of Egypt and Canaan, and our father found no sustenance. But when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers first. And the second time, Joseph was made known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. And then Joseph sent and called for his father, Jacob, and all his relatives to him, 75 people. And so Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died, he and our fathers. And they were carried back to Shechem and laid in the tomb that Abraham bought for a sum of money from the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem. Now again, Stephen is emphasizing the spiritual presence of God with Joseph while he was where? While he was in Egypt. He was taken away to Egypt. There was no temple. There was no temple necessary. God was with Jacob, I'm sorry, Joseph, the whole time. And from there, Stephen begins to set up the comparison of Moses and his life with Jesus Christ. Showing how Moses was born, finding favor with God, and being preserved in miraculous ways. Showing that Moses was mighty in words and deeds. Recounting how the people rejected Moses as their redeemer, and Moses went to the wilderness. And skipping down to verse 30, it says, When forty years had passed, An angel of the Lord appeared to him in the flame of fire in the bush in the wilderness of Mount Sinai. And when Moses saw it, he marveled at the sight. And as he drew near to observe, the voice of the Lord came to him, saying, I am the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses trembled and dared not look. And then the Lord said to him, Take your sandals off your feet, for the place where you stand is holy ground. Wherever God's presence is, 
is holy ground. Not just the temple. Not just what the council saw as holy ground. Stephen's emphasizing that God and his glory and his work was not confined to the temple, but there in the wilderness, on Mount Sinai, in a bush on the side of a mountain, God appeared and said, this ground is holy. Take off your sandals. It's holy because I am here. God appeared to Moses in the wilderness before there was even a tabernacle, much less a temple. And then from there, God called and commissioned Moses. And in verse 34, it says, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their groaning and have come down to deliver them. And now come, I will send you to Egypt. This Moses, whom they rejected, saying, who made you a ruler and a judge? Is the one God sent to be a ruler and a deliverer by the hand of the angel who appeared to him in the bush. He brought them out after he had shown wonders and signs in the land of Egypt and in the Red Sea and in the wilderness for 40 years. So even though Israel rejected Moses and his leadership as their deliverer, God had appointed him through all of the specific signs he gave. And Stephen's point is that you did the same thing to Jesus. You rejected the one who came to be your deliverer. You rejected and said pretty much the same thing. Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? And the one that God sent, they rejected. But God kept His promises. And He delivered the children of Israel even though they initially rejected Moses. And in all that time, Israel continued to reject Moses. In verse 37, it says, This is that Moses who said to the children of Israel, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brethren. Him you shall hear. This is he who was in the congregation in the wilderness with the angel, who spoke to him on Mount Sinai with our fathers, the one who received the living oracles to give to us, whom our fathers would not obey, but rejected. And in their hearts they turned back to Egypt saying to Aaron, make us gods to go before us. As for this Moses who brought us out of the land of Egypt, we did not know what's become of him. And they made a calf in those days, offered sacrifices to the idol, and rejoiced in the works of their own hands. Moses prophesied that God would raise up a prophet after him that would be greater than he. And he instructed those living in the day that prophet came to listen. They didn't. They rejected him. And Stephen pointed out like the people rejected Moses, they also were rejecting the prophet who had come, speaking of their rejection of Jesus. And in verse 41, Stephen is bringing the parallel of how the people in the wilderness worshipped the golden calf, the work of their hand, and how the Jews were worshipping the work of their hand. The reality is they were worshipping the temple. That's what they held in veneration. They worshipped the temple instead of the God of the temple. That's where they had it off. And in verse 42, it says, Then God turned and gave them up to worship the host of heaven, as it is written in the book of the prophets. Did you offer me slaughtered animals and sacrifices during 40 years in the wilderness, O house of Israel? You also took up the tabernacle of Molech and the star of your God, Remphan, images which you made to worship, and I will carry you away beyond Babylon. Now, throughout the Old Testament, You can read the cycle of the children of Israel continuously rejecting God. Being punished and coming back to Him. Turning to idols yet again, being punished and coming back to Him. Over and over and over again. God gave them over to their fleshly desires, but not without repercussions. Because they were taken away into captivity. After that captivity... We never read again about them worshiping idols. Got them out of they got that part out of their system. At least the idols that they saw as idols. They just substituted the idols for other things. Because that's what the human heart does. I'm sure, I may be, you know, presuming, but I am sure you guys don't have a calf set up in your house that you bow down to. I'm kind of sure of that. But I guarantee you, just because you're human. There is something else that takes precedent in your life because we're fleshly and human. We could say God is the God or throne on the throne of our hearts. We can say that He is our God, but the reality is we struggle in those things. Why? Because we're human. And God, in His grace and His mercy 
And his love for us covers us so completely, works with us so absolutely to work with us again and again and again, refining us, conforming us into his image, sanctifying us, setting us apart for a holy use, even inside of our fleshliness. What an amazing God we serve. And yet here, Stephen is citing the judgment of the children of Israel. I will carry you away beyond Babylon. He's citing a judgment prophesied in Amos 5, 25 through 27. With one slight modification. A modification with a purpose. Amos says that the people would be carried away beyond Damascus. Stephen says that they will be carried away beyond Babylon. Why did he change that? Well, the prophecy of Amos was given to the northern kingdom. And Stephen quotes the text, but alters it because he's not speaking to the leaders of the northern kingdom, but to the leaders of Israel in the south who were taken away to Babylon. And it's their history that he has in mind and wants to keep the council focused upon. And from there, Stephen gets to his main point, that relationship with God is not dependent on anything made by the hand of man. In verse 44, it says, Our father had the tabernacle of witness in the wilderness as he appointed, instructing Moses to make it according to the pattern that he had seen, which our fathers, having received it in turn, also brought with Joshua into the land possessed by the Gentiles, whom God drove out before the face of our fathers until the days of David, who found favor before God and asked to find a dwelling for the God of Jacob. But Solomon built him a house. However, the Most High does not dwell in temples made with hands. As the prophet says, heaven is my throne and earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? Stephen starts here by pointing out that neither the presence of the tabernacle nor the presence of the temple kept Israel from rejecting God and the messengers that God had sent. And Stephen concludes all that by confronting their idolatry of the temple and making sure that they really understood that relationship with God has nothing to do with a place, has nothing to do with a building or any other conceivable confinement. I am blessed that we have a facility that we get to meet in, we get to fellowship in. But God isn't here just on Sunday, you know? He doesn't come and visit with us and then stay here when we all go away. I've already said, where does God dwell in the new covenant? He dwells in the temple made without hands. He dwells in the temple made by his hand. So when you leave, where did God go? He went with you. He went with me. This is a building, a facility we get to meet in. But God is the God of the living, not a God of a place. He is a God of the living, and He wants to work in you and through you so that His Spirit that dwells inside of you can pour out of you to other people. The problem with the council, the problem with the Jewish people at that time, was they saw the temple as the thing they needed to hold in veneration. And like I said, they had lost sight of the God of the temple. It's just like God had said through the prophet Isaiah, Heaven is my throne. Earth is my footstool. What house will you build for me? Says the Lord. Or what is the place of my rest? Has my hand not made all these things? And so after concluding his journey through the history of all of this, Stephen now applies the sermon to his listeners. Now you can imagine the angry whisperings, the snide remarks as Stephen gave this history lesson. Who are you to tell us anything like this? Especially as they started getting the point that Stephen was speaking to them, about them. Well, obviously, Stephen was able to see their reaction as the history lesson was beginning to make sense to them as to where Stephen was pointing. Stephen could see that they were yet again standing in rebellion to God and rejecting the one, Jesus Christ, whom God had sent. And he rebukes them sharply for the hardness of their hearts, the pride and self-righteousness that they continued to stand in the same rebellion of hearts as their fathers had before them. In verse 51, he said, You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so do you. I imagine Stephen said that more broken-hearted than angry. Broken-hearted. 
Because the whole point of what he's doing is his love for Jesus. And out of that, he had a love for every single one of them on the council. I more imagine he's broken heart to say, you stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. You always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did. So do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. Now, 17 times in the Old Testament, God called the children of Israel stiff-necked. And God also lets them know that they have uncircumcised hearts. In Deuteronomy 10, God speaks of those thoughts. And Stephen draws on that and how he addressed the Sanhedrin. Listen to this. In Deuteronomy 10, you don't need to turn there, but listen to this. In <coughs> Deuteronomy 10, Moses is speaking about God and the essence of the law of God. In chapter 10, verse 12, it says, Now Israel, what does the Lord your God require of you? But to fear the Lord your God, to walk in all his ways and to love him. To serve the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul. And to keep the commandments of the Lord and his statutes, which I command you today for your good. Indeed, heaven and the highest heavens belong to the Lord your God. Also the earth with all that is in it. The Lord delighted only in your fathers to love them. And he chose their descendants after them. You above all peoples as it is to this day. Therefore, because of all that, because of what God has done, therefore, circumcise the foreskin of your heart and be stiff-necked no longer. He's saying, soften your heart towards God. Circumcise your heart. What an ugly picture. The hardness of our heart that needs to be cut away so that it can be soft and pliable and usable for the Lord. So it can be a heart that can look at God and go, oh, I love you. I do love you. We still have to circumcise the foreskin of our heart and be stiff-necked no longer because of our flesh. And in Deuteronomy 10, 17, Moses went on and said, For the Lord your God is God of gods and Lord of lords, the great God, mighty and awesome, who shows no partiality nor takes a bribe. He administers justice for the fatherless and the widow and loves the stranger, giving him food and clothing. Therefore, love the stranger, for you were strangers in the land of Egypt. You shall fear the Lord your God. You shall serve him, and to him you shall hold fast and take oaths in his name. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. Now, the children of Israel could physically see all that God had done for them to get them to the promised land. How much so, more so us? Jesus Christ has done even more than that. Because He didn't just do all that He did so that we could have a physical land. He did all He did so that we could have an eternity with Him. He did all He did so that we could enter into a love relationship with Almighty Holy God. He did all of that for us. He is your praise. He is your God who has done for you these great and awesome things which your eyes have seen. All of that had to, do, had to be ringing in the ears as, they, as the Sanhedrin heard from Stephen. That the reality is God desires and requires a love relationship with His people. And the people continually rejected the relationship and had turned it into a method of transactional duty instead of what it was supposed to be. And they began to think that they could earn their way to righteousness because of all of the edicts they had added onto the law to clarify the law, to give them an end to say, I've kept the law. A law that was unkeepable and pointed to sin. They believed they were fulfilling. You stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit as your fathers did, so did you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who foretold the coming of the just one, of whom you now have become the betrayers and murderers, who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. That, I think, was probably the most biting remark to them. Because in their self-righteous justification, they believed they had. It really must have set them on edge. You who have received the law by direction of angels and have not kept it. 
Remember, the Pharisees especially prided themselves on their obedience to the law. They would cross the street when they saw a sinner coming on the side of the street they were on. They would cross the street to get to the other side so they wouldn't be tainted by the sinner that might walk past them. They believed they were that righteous. And even later, Paul will express this thought when he described his pre-Christ thinking in Philippians 3.6, where he said that concerning righteousness, which is in the law, basically he said, I am blameless. That's how he saw himself. These self-righteous, pious, prideful men truly believed that they were able to keep a law that requires utter perfection. That is how far from relationship with God they were. It was about duty. It was earned And they believed they had achieved righteousness by self. And Stephen brings this down around their ears. And he had also torn down the thought that a permanent stationary temple was necessary for God to be with them. The thought being, here's the temple. When you want to meet God, you must come to Him here. Instead, Stephen's pointing out through the history lesson that God had a different plan, a different heart. Say, no, it's not about that. You know what it is? I love you so much. I'm going to come to you. Just like with Abraham, just like with Joseph, just like with the patriarchs, just like with all of that history, where were they? They weren't here, but I went to them. Don't you see? It's the same thing I want to do with you. That's what Stephen was trying to get across to the council, that God had come to them. No matter where you are, no matter who you are, no matter what you've done, that he looks at us and he says, I've paid the price for you through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And now, oh, now we could have a relationship. It's not duty. Never has been, never will be. The greatest commandment was told to us by Jesus, just as Moses recounted it for the children of Israel. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Out of that, love others as yourself. That's how Jesus summed it all up. Everything you have, everything you are, everything you will ever will be. That's what God requires. Why? Because of what He did for you. It's what He's given you. And out of that, His love will flow through you so that you can love others in an impossible way. The same as you love yourself. I don't care how hard you try. In yourself, you cannot love other people like you love yourself. You will always love yourself more. You're human nothing wrong it's just you're human it's only through loving God and his love for us that his love can flow through us so that we could love others like we love yourself Stephen understood this to be true but the council they couldn't receive it at all because in verse 54 it says when they heard these things they were cut to the heart and they gnashed at him with their teeth now Cut to the heart. We've already gone over this a few times, but there are only two places in the whole of the Bible where that phrasing is used. Here, and like we went over a few chapters ago, Acts 5.33, after Peter's sermon, to the Sanhedrin. And again, literally, the verbiage means that the council, their hearts were sawn asunder, were sawn in two. That it had cut their heart so deeply. And in Acts 5, it resulted in the apostles being beaten And as we went over in that passage, they weren't just beaten with a stick. They weren't just beaten with hands. No, it meant that they were whipped. They were flogged with a cat of nine tails. Scourged the same way as Jesus was. Forty lashes save one. Thirty-nine times with the multi-lashed whip. With each strand having sharp shards of bone or pottery at the end of each lash. Then it would be brought down and then twisted to dig in to the skin and yanked back to remove flesh. And yet, the apostles, all 12 of them, who went through that scourging, left that place rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer for the gospel of Jesus Christ. That they were counted worthy to be scourged the same way that Jesus was. And here we see the same. The Sanhedrin, the council, were again cut to the heart, but not to repentance. They seethed and gnashed their teeth in Stephen, in utter rage. And this gnashing of teeth, it's not a reaction that generally comes on like that. It's a building of anger. It's a seething that builds to a rage, probably beginning as Stephen's sermon was getting more and more pointed. 
And progressively, they understood that he was speaking of them as if they were sinners in need of a Savior. Who is he to tell us that? We are righteous. We keep the law. And progressively, as they understood, they seethed and gnashed their teeth at Stephen. And even still, Stephen is filled with the Holy Spirit and is at peace through it all and sees Jesus in his glory. In verse 55 it says, But he, being full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God and said, Look, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. What a contrast to the behavior of the council. The phrasing for Stephen is that Stephen was filled through all of his being with the Holy Spirit. Glorious thought. Filled to every part of his being with the Holy Spirit. And Stephen, Stephen saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was standing there alone. But he wasn't abandoned in this encounter with the council. The Holy Spirit had been with him and in him throughout the whole time there. And now Stephen is able to see that Jesus is with him standing next to the Father. Stephen was not alone, even through what happened next. In verse 57, it says, And then they cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at him with one accord. And they cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. So Stephen declared that he saw Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Well, that was too much. The Sanhedrin reacted quickly. They reacted violently. And they reacted in unison. When Jesus had stood before the same body of men as recorded in Matthew 26, 64 through 66, Jesus declared that he would sit at the right hand of God. And they had the same reaction. And it sealed his death. They accused Jesus of blasphemy. And here when Stephen tells them what he sees, they hear that as they called him, that man, they couldn't even say the name of Jesus, as we saw last chapter, they heard that that man, as they called him, was standing next to the throne of God. They cried out with a loud voice, stopped their ears, and ran at Stephen with one accord. Now, these were distinguished, respected, learned men behaving this way. It would be as if you go down to our our state house, and the senators or legislature there got upset by one dude at the front, and they all came rushing down to grab him and throw him out of the Capitol. It would be a decorum you wouldn't hear of. It would be something they would generally have someone else do. But in their rage and anger, these distinguished, respected, learned men reacted in an extreme way. They wailed in agony. They covered their ears at at the revelation of God, which they regarded as blasphemy. You know, it really is a dangerous thing to be religious apart from relationship. It really is a dangerous thing. Because apart from relationship with Jesus Christ, what's left? Self. That's pretty much all that's left. Religion without relationship is an empty, prideful, self-righteous attempt to reach God on your own terms. Relationship is required because at one point, Jesus will stand. And we will be kneeling before Him. And He's going to look at some and go, I never knew you. It's about relationship. They're going to cite all the things they did on His behalf. I prophesied in your name. I healed in your name. I did this in your name. And He's going to say, I never knew you. Relationship is required. Because the reality is there is only one way, one path, that leads to a righteous standing before holy almighty God. And that way is through Jesus Christ alone. And the council could not accept it at all. They stoned Stephen. Killing him to quiet him. This is what Jesus warned about in John 16 verses 2 through 3. Where he said yes the time is coming. That whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the father. Nor me. It was about relationship. They were religious without relationship. They didn't know the one they thought they were serving. That is what they thought they were doing, though. They thought they were offering God service. They could not accept that they were rejecting God, that they did not know God, and that the only way that they could know Him was to humble themselves and accept Jesus is Messiah. So in self-righteous fury, they rushed Stephen. They run at Him. 
And the word used here is kind of interesting to me. It made me chuckle when I saw it. But it's the same word used to describe the mad rush of the herd of swine when the demons were cast over to them in Mark chapter 5, verse 13, when the, when the demons came out of the one guy and there was a legion of demons and they said, don't send us to the pit. Why don't you send us to the swine? Jesus went, okay. And there was a mad rush of all the hogs across the, uh, the bluff, over the cliff, and plunged themselves into the sea. Well, it's the same word for that type of mad rush absolutely uncontrolled, in a panic, and in blind rage. They ran at him. An out-of-control mob rushed at Stephen, completely intense with insane fervor. They dragged him out of town and stoned him to death. And the extent of their rage was shown by their execution to Stephen, which was done without regard for Roman law. They weren't allowed to put someone to death. And they performed it according to a traditional Jewish custom. Stoning. In such a rage, they didn't care that it was illegal for them to do it. They were so enraged, they didn't care at all. They killed him in blind flurry. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the feet of a young man named Saul. What does that mean? It means Saul stood there as the supervisor of the operation, overseeing and making sure it was carried out unto the death. Saul was charged with making sure the stoning happened. Because that's what the role would be. The one who was in charge of it, that's where they would lay the clothes at his feet, the, cl the cloaks. And as a member of the Sanhedrin, Saul also had approved of Stephen's execution. Now, we're told he's a young man. That literally means a man in his prime. It's not like he was a teenager sitting there that didn't have a vote. He was old enough to be a member of the Sanhedrin. And later, we will see in Acts 26.10 that Paul will say, I cast my vote against them. And the plain implication that he had a vote as a member of the Sanhedrin. Because we're told that he consented to Stephen's death. In verse 59 of chapter 7, it says, They stoned Stephen as he was calling on God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he knelt down and cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not charge them with the sin. And when he said this, he fell asleep. Now Stephen's life ended the same way it had been lived. In complete trust in God believing that Jesus would take care of him in the life to come. What faith? What heart of forgiveness? I'm absolutely convinced that any man who is willing to pay the price may be used of God regardless of talents or gifts. Not perhaps to the extent of some, but certainly to the full limit of his capacity. And if not, the fault is his. No, it may cost a good deal. God does not always reveal the whole price at once. But when we reach that place where we are so desperately in earnest about it that we are willing to make any sacrifice, it is then that God can begin to use us. Are you willing to pay the price? Stephen was. He didn't know what was going to happen to him. And even if he did, I have a hard time thinking it would have deterred him at all. He spoke truth. He spoke truth in love. And we know there was an effect that he could never have dreamed of. We're going to look at this next week, but cheat ahead and look at Acts chapter, one, or chapter 8, verses 1 through 3. It says, Now Saul was consenting to his death. And at that time, a great persecution arose against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. And devout men carried Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering every house and dragging off men and women, committing them to prison. So Saul not only consented to the stoning of Stephen, he supervised it. He cast his vote against him. And he would have been charged to making sure that he was dead. And he continued in his seething rage and hate. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service and these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. Saul absolutely thought that's what he was doing. All the havoc that he created, all the turmoil he caused, and as he later says, the murders he committed, he thought he was doing God's service. Even in his seething anger, he thought he was doing God's service. He didn't know that his anger was actually against God. But Jesus met him on that road to Damascus and suddenly he knew Jesus. And everything changed, which means any single member of that council that did this, any single member of that Sanhedrin that crucified our Savior, 
that did this to Stephen, that scourged the apostles, any single one of them could have come to know Jesus as Messiah. And I pray and I hope that we see some of them there. But Saul, in his rage, he had no idea that he was fighting against God. But when he meant Jesus, everything changed. Stephen had no idea that the result of his visit with the council would be his death. He was being faithful to the call, and his call cost him a great deal. Stephen could not foresee that Saul would become Paul, and that he would spread the gospel throughout the Roman Empire faithfully, and that the church would have the majority of its doctrine come as a result of that dude, Saul who helped put Stephen to death and made sure he was really dead. He had to make sure. That guy gave us the majority of our doctrine. That's how complete grace is. You think you've done something as bad as Saul? Do you bear the guilt and the shame of what you've done in your life? Consider grace. Look at what Saul did. And how God transformed him so he could become Paul. Millions of people have come into relationship with Jesus Christ as a result of Stephen's willingness to be a man full of faith in the Holy Spirit. Full of the Holy Spirit to the entirety of his being. Are you willing to pay the price to be used by God? Are you willing to live a life that be, could be called full of faith? Are you willing to relinquish self and self-righteousness to be in real relationship with the one who died for you? Are you willing to live then in a way that allows the Holy Spirit to fill you to the entirety of your being? The price may seem high, but I know for Stephen there's no way he's looking back at eternity with regrets. There is a cost. We're told in the Gospels, that once there was a scribe, a lawyer, who came to Jesus and said, I will follow you wherever you go. I just want to follow you. And then Jesus looked at him. And you know he had the understanding of that man's heart. And he put his finger on the area that was going to be the cost for him. He said, foxes have holes. Birds have nests. But I have nowhere to lay my head. Well, that cost was too high for that scribe. He valued those things more than Jesus. And he left. We're told of another time that a rich young ruler came to Jesus. And he came to him. And he asked what he needed to do to lay hold of eternal life. He knew something was missing. We're told in Mark 10 that when that man came to him, when he cried out with a genuine heart, what must I do? What do I have to do? That when Jesus looked at him, he loved him. And so he told him the same thing. I see what is holding your heart. I'm going to put my finger on that. Sell what you have. Give to the poor. You'll have treasure in heaven and then take up your cross and follow me. We're told that that man went away sorrowful because the cost was too high for him. Those are all things that had a hold of the hearts of those men. What has yours? What keeps your heart from being like the heart that Stephen had? What is it the Lord is putting his finger on in your heart? And do you deem that cost to be too high? Or do you look at him and go, I don't care what the cost is anymore. I don't care anymore. That was what was going on in the early church. We see all those things that they were able to do, what they said, what they went through. We see all those things. But the reality is the Holy Spirit was so fresh in their lives that they didn't see a cost too high. I know I do. There's times where I know the Lord's putting His finger on something in my heart. I go, eh, no, I'm not ready for that. But God is a good shepherd. Our Lord is a good shepherd and He's so faithful. To keep coming back. I'm going, you ready now? Are you ready yet? There is stuff in your life that you may deem to be a cost too high. My prayer is that the Lord matures you, grows you, and disciples you to the point that you go, oh, you know what? I don't got time for that. I'm holding on to nothing except you. 
and that we could walk the same way Stephen did. Not like that scribe. Not like that rich young ruler. But that we would walk free like Stephen did and that the Holy Spirit would fill you and me to the entirety of our being so that we could see lives transformed, so we could see God's name lifted up and glorified, so that we could see His kingdom furthered, so that we could see all those people that need Him to know His love, His righteousness, that He paid such a high price for them. What does that take? It takes our willingness to count the cost and go, oh, you're worth it. You're worth it. You're worth it. Are you willing to pay that price? Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for what you've done. And thank you that there is nothing, nothing that you have held back from us. You are the same yesterday, today, and forever. So the same God that was with Stephen, with Paul, with all of the apostles, is the same one with us. And Lord, you require the same things of us that you did of them. Are we willing to pay that cost? Oh Lord, I pray we would be. So that you could use us to the entirety of our being, filling us with your Holy Spirit. And we could glorify you. Work in our lives, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.